Well, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Heather Himmelberger, Director at the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for getting on our webinar today. Um, you can see the map that's up there that kind of just displays the different places where people are signing in today, just to give you an idea of who's all participating. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that this is part of our project from EPA on the uh, smart management for small water systems that the Environmental Finance Center Network has been doing for EPA for the last 18 months. Uh, this is the, actually the last month of that project and pretty soon we'll be kicking off round two of the project. So we'll be delivering some more in-person and webinar trainings um, coming up soon as part of our round two project. Under this project we've provided, fund or provided training in six different topic areas, asset management, rates and finance, um, access to multiple funding sources, uh, regional, uh, regional cooperation, um, energy efficiency, and water loss. Uh, today's webinar is part of the asset management um, activity under that project. And it's going to be a little bit different than the, the webinars that we did before. We had done five different webinars on asset management. And you can access those um, past webinars under our efcnetwork.org if you go under past trainings. You will find five different webinars about asset management and you're welcome to listen to any of those. This is going to be a little bit different. This is going to be a, an opportunity to ask questions and receive answers about asset management. So it will be a lot less formal than our traditional webinars. And the way to make this webinar as useful to you as possible is to please provide us questions, you know, things that are on your mind about asset management. So during the webinar, please uh, feel free to type in any questions that you have about asset management or are interested in, and we'll be um, answering as many of those as we can throughout the webinar. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce uh, Ross Waugh. Uh, we have a very unique opportunity that I really wanted to take advantage of, uh, where Ross is visiting the United States as part of a conference on uh, road networks down in Miami and we rerouted him to New Mexico to help us with some asset management stuff and share his expertise and so we've been able to put him on this webinar to be able to ask you or answer some of your questions and the great thing about Ross is that even though he's one of the premier asset management folks in New Zealand and I think probably one of the best in the whole country of New Zealand um, the greatest thing is he can bring it down to a level that is really effective for anybody. So it's not a lot of stuff that's at a high um, uh, technical expertise level that nobody can understand. So uh, Russ is really able to bring it down to simple terms and that's one of the things we'll be talking about today probably is, is it's really important to keep asset management simple and easy to do. So Russ, if you want to say a few words in introduction, that would be great. And, and you who are listening, um, I, I said to Heather a while ago, look, I'm going to this conference in Miami, which is next week, TRB, and she said, look, it's Albuquerque's on the way to Miami. I said, well, okay, yeah, that's, that <laughs> seems fair from New Zealand, so so drew a line on the map. So here I am, so it's very nice to be here, and uh, over in New Zealand at the moment, it's just the start of winter, it got pretty cold, and, and here in New Mexico, it's the start of, uh, was a bit past spring, and it's getting into early summer, and it's very pleasant. So uh, I've been enjoying the nice warmth of New Mexico compared with a, a cold New Zealand winter. Exactly. Um, so as a beginning, we're just going to do a couple of questions just to get things started. And again, you know, please submit your own questions. Uh, but one of the things I thought we would start with is just to have Ross maybe talk a little bit about the benefits they've seen in New Zealand from having done asset management for about 18 years now or so. They've been in the practice of asset management at their municipal level and their public works. And I thought it'd be good to just have him maybe talk a little bit about what they've seen in terms of benefits uh, from having done this process. Well, thank you, Heather. And um, the, the slide that Heather's just put up, we'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, that, that slide came out of uh, a study a couple of years ago. But um, just a bit of background for you. New Zealand um, had a, a really large recession from 1988 through to about 1993. It's five years and it was pretty vicious. Uh, we had 12% true unemployment and um, mortgage interest rates got up to over 20% and a lot of unemployment, a lot of, lot of problems. And 
during that period, we just spent nothing on our infrastructure. It was just bare minimum maintenance, no capital work, new funding at all, um, no uh, big economic adjustments going on, and no asset renewal going on. So at the end of that period, our, uh, our chief auditor, our auditor general, had a look at what was going on and got very concerned about the fact that we had a whole heap of undeclared liabilities uh, around municipal infrastructure. Uh, just because there'd been a long time before, since any reasonable money had been spent. So he produced a report to the government, our government in 1995, and as a result in 1996, asset management and 10-year financial uh, forward forecasts for municipal and road authorities became mandatory. So since 1996, right through to now, 18 years we've been doing asset management. Our political cycle is three years, not four years, so in, in our asset management updating uh, matches the political cycle. So we've had, um, in theory, we've had six cycles. Uh, the reality is the ball got dropped in the, in the early 2000s, and so we've had about five cycles of asset management, updating, and, and re renewal planning. And it, because it's mandatory, everybody had to do it. Um, we've had a lot of benefits from that. The first of which was everybody had to get a decent inventory. Um, and that took a, took a time for, for authorities. A lot of people had um, quite poor records. Uh, other people or other authorities had very good records. But it was also during a period where GIS was coming on stream and um, uh, asset information system databases were coming on stream. So a lot of people took the opportunity to take their paper records and digitize them into GISs. Um, so prior to that, we, in utilities, we'd had block sheets primarily. and uh, Maybe um, you know contract records we would put in uh, facilities and pump stations and things like that. Um, so we ended up with reasonably good inventories. We we had a a, a fairly good handle on what we had. Um, we had to value them as part of our, our mandatory requirements. So we had uh, that was typically based on replacement costs. Um, so we had a, a de depreciated replacement cost valuations. Um, and so we, we knew what we had, when we'd, when we'd built it. Um, and a lot of uh, municipal authorities look after water in New Zealand. There's only two or three water authorities that are distinct from municipal authorities. But everybody had break records. So we typically had uh, records of breaks, records of repairs, um, records of complaints. And they all ended up in, in systems and then ended up getting publicly reported. And our, our government, central government authorities, uh, effectively the same as your federal authorities, were then able to aggregate all that information and produce uh, an overview picture of what was happening in the whole country. Um, what that did uh, initially was just get all the information on the table and, and found out in the, in, in the order of the general had been right. In many cases, there were significant backlogs of uh, asset renewals um, and maintenance even. Um, and it also kicked off a very large debate in our community, which is still going on to some extent, uh, around the affordability of assets and just what people were prepared to pay for. And as you all know, everybody wants their water and wastewater for free at the highest possible standard with no disruption at all ever. Um, and if anything, they want it less than free. You know, if you could pay them for taking the water, they'd be even happier. So that's not distinct to the US. That's that's New Zealand as well. And so we. And the second thing is, yeah, all of our communities want somebody else to pay for their services. So they want uh, our central government or your equivalent of federal government to pay for everything. So, and there's a reason. There's a bit of history for that. Back in the 1950s and 60s, New Zealand had a very big economic boom. Um, and a lot of our utilities, uh, water and wastewater utilities in our smaller towns and cities were put in at that time with uh, co-funding from the government, um, sometimes 60-70%, but always, always 50%. So with the renewals that we've got going on at the moment, it's the first time that communities have actually ever paid the whole amount of the cost of the, the asset replacement. So we've had this debate. Um, it would be fair to say ultimately that communities have come to see that they do need the services and uh, the governing bodies, in our case municipal councils, uh, have have been able to go out politically and say, look, we didn't spend a lot of money for 20 years, we now need to spend some money and so the, the rates and the tariffs have been going up. Uh, but it's an ongoing tension and struggle and I don't see that, that stopping anytime soon. Um, so that's, that's a bit of the background here. Okay.
Uh, one of the things that Ross and I have talked about when he's here is it's kind of important for people to understand the, com the connections between what kind of service you're going to pro provide somebody, what level of funding they're going to get, and what kind of risk they might take on from that, and how all those things fit together. So um, I think Ross and his colleagues have come up with a really good way of representing this, um, and that's kind of the picture that you see on the screen. And Ross, if you could talk a little bit about the diagram that's on the screen and how these three factors fit together, that would be great. Right. So this this diagram, um, when when the recession hit the U.S., it, it hit the west rest of the OECD as well. And New Zealand has had, had recession from 2007 to about 2012. We came out of it a couple of years ago, and this was. Uh, obviously puts pressure on funding on infrastructure and particularly in our land transport sector it's all funded, co-funded by the central government via um, fuel taxes. So two years ago um, the, the minister in charge of that area, uh, so your equivalent of cabinet secretary I guess, um, created a, a task force to look at funding of road maintenance and we got the job of, myself and some colleagues got the job of uh, looking at all the road controlling authorities in New Zealand, um, equivalent of state DOTs I guess, and um, looking at what they were doing and, and the asset management and the implications of that. So it was quite a wide ranging study. We had to send out questionnaires to everybody, analyse the results, uh, follow up on that and then comment on the trends. And, and one of the things that came out was this diagram that you're looking at and it applies to utilities as well. And it was simply that We'd had about a decade of increased funding in New Zealand and in the road area, uh, also in utilities, and the levels of service had actually come up. And so this diagram is like the, the playground apparatus with the spring and the balance board. And typically what happens with that is if you if you push down on one area, the other two come up. Um, so what had happened in New Zealand, we'd been, we'd been funding more and the levels of service had come up. and we felt that the risks of failure and risks of non-service delivery and things like that had gone down. So looking at the diagram, levels of service and funding had come up and risk had gone down. What's happening at the moment and what was happening two years ago was that the funding was kept becoming constrained and getting pushed down. And the feeling ultimately was, uh, we've got some big levels of service reviews going on in land transport as well uh, around standardising and, and trying to, I think, stop over delivery. Um, so the feeling was well, you're going to push the funding down for long enough, ultimately levels of service must push down, though it will probably take five years before that's noticeable, uh, and risk will push up. And I think the same thing happens in utilities as well. The issue that we've got, and, and this thinking came out two years ago and we've only just started trying to model uh, the dynamics of the system is that nobody knows quite how these relationships work and it's very difficult to model because there's an awful lot of parameters in there. So one of our really large uh, transportation networks has started doing some work on modeling this based on their own data and seeing what happens but we've got a long way to go yet. But the reason I, I talked to Heather about it and we wanted to share it to you today is that conceptually that is what happens. If you push funding down ultimately levels of service have to drop and risks across non-delivery of service or, or risks of increased phase uh, will increase. And, and it's useful to understand that conceptually, however, uh, just be aware that nobody knows what the answer to the break points or the trade-offs are in any sort of definitive way at the moment. Great. Uh, Don, I'll just check in with you before we continue. Have any uh, questions come in from our um, audience yet? If not, we'll keep going, but if, if so, we'll take some questions. Yes, we do have some. The first question is, I have heard many different opinions about the most important very first step to take to get started with asset management. In your opinion, what is the most important very first step that should be taken? Go ahead, Ross. Do we, do we want to jump forward to that, that slide with the, the rugby players? Okay. This oops, way, oops. go back one. There we go. So this this slide here, and some of you might recognize the, the team there, um, one of the learnings we've certainly had in New Zealand over the past uh, 
18 years is that you really need to do the basics of asset management well. And those basics are having an asset register, asset inventory, and keeping it in good condition and in good records as best you can. The second thing is having a range of condition assessments that are realistic. And the third thing is getting your asset maintenance programs well well sorted out. And if you only do those three things and you do nothing else, you, those are really important first steps. I think it's impossible to do good asset management without a good asset register. So there's a bit of work in, in getting that. Um, and the reason the picture of the football players is it's, it's like any game of football. If you don't do your basics well, then the other side are going to, to beat you right down the paddock. And um, so it's it's Good football teams do the basics very, very well, and then they do the fancy stuff on top of that. Um, if you if you can't get your ball back to the quarterback, then you're never going to win a game. So that's it's that sort of thinking. And so I think asset registers are really important. And um, you know, one way to get started in the asset register is, of course, mapping. Uh, many people, because we have a lot of field assets, you know, the pipe, the tanks, the hydrants, the valves, the meters, those types of things that are in the field. If you can map your system, that's a good way to get started in the asset register or the asset inventory process because then you can start also getting locations of assets and it can help you kind of, um, you know, put those assets into some kind of spreadsheet, database, program, whatever you want to use. Um, so that's another thing to think about is, you know, using a map to help you with the asset register and pictures, you know, taking pictures is another good way to get started with the asset register. Uh, many systems have found that to really short, shorten the process of developing an inventory if they can go out and take pictures of at least what they can see. I mean, you can't see all your assets, but if you can see it, that can help you with getting the asset information in the register and even in the condition assessment to some extent that can help you. So as you're getting started, you know, two ways to maybe start the asset inventory process would be, you know, maybe some mapping and some picture taking. Yeah, one well, one of the things we've found here that I'm sure that you've had the same instance here is that sometimes people just get involved in far too much detail with their asset register building and uh, they, they just try to, to do the hundred percent um, high level of detail and get bogged down and, and then don't have the, the human resources or the, or the contract resources to do that and never get it finished. We, we, in New Zealand we had some notable cases like that where people maybe took three or four years and never got finished and so I think it's uh, if you can't do it in six months you're not doing it right, um, even three months, but it's just get if you haven't started, give it a hit, uh, do, it, do it at a level of detail that allows you to finish in three to six months and then that will form the basis of all the rest of your analysis around asset management. Yeah, you don't need to collect information that you won't value. Uh, if you're not going to use the information for something, you don't need to collect it. And, you know, I think like Ross said, if you just get started in a level that you feel comfortable with, you can always add to it later. If you want to add some extra fields or extra information about an asset, you can always add to it later. But if you start down the path of collecting too much, like we knew one particular um, uh, authority was going to put in about 45 different pieces of data about an asset and it was just out of control. There was no way they can do it. And after about the first five assets they realized that wasn't going to happen. So they regrouped and said we really only need about maybe six to ten pieces of information depending on the asset. We're only going to collect that now and if we need something later we can go back and add it. So again you don't need to make it so complicated that you can't get it done. Um, it's really about collecting the information that you think will be valuable to you in your asset management program going forward, you know, the stuff that you have access to that feels comfortable so that you don't get so bogged down you can never get any, you know, get anywhere past your inventory. Yeah, look, and, and I started doing asset register builds back in the mid-90s and uh, a really good tip is to pick quite a small area of your utility or if you've, you've got a number of towns that you're looking after one of the smaller towns, um, in my case I had a town that was uh, had 137, I can still remember the num number, 137 sewer manholes um, or inspection holes because um, the thing is you can put that into your asset register really quick and then have a look at it and say well does that do what we want it to do and if you don't like it, we actually had four goes at that before because it was really, there were no manuals back in those days, it was really seat of your pants, try it out. 
But pick something small and do a pilot and, and get your data capture and your data information levels at everybody agrees if that's what we want, that's what we need. And but if you get if you if it's not right, you, you know, it's real quick to, to redo or to do over. Um, and then apply it to your bigger areas once you've got that sorted out. And if you do the pilot, get everybody in agreement, then do the bigger areas. That works really well. Yeah, we had a, a, one of the videos in our asset management manual is from Dover, New Hampshire, and the gentleman there started with his hydrants because he really wanted to get comfortable with the whole asset management, asset inventory process. So he did all of his hydrants because that was something he could see. He could go out and look at them, he could touch them, he could take a picture of them, and he did a, an inventory of his uh, water hydrants as a starting point, got very comfortable with that, and then was able to move on. So, you know, like as Ross mentioned, if you pick maybe a subset of your assets and try it out, it can give you the confidence and the skills that you need to go further with some of the assets that might be a little more difficult because you can't see them or you don't know where they are. Um, Don, do you have a next question? Yes, um, and just this is just clarification. By asset register, you're referring to an asset inventory, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, um, and then a, a follow-up question to what we've been talking about: uh, the good high-level basics that make sense. Thanks. When do you know you've got enough of these three before starting on the next? Are you talking about? I guess they're mentioning uh, when do you have enough of the register condition assessment and asset maintenance program. I, I'm assuming that's the uh, question. You know, when right. you, when do you have enough of that to go on to more? Yeah. Well, I think the thing is, you'll know when you've got your asset inventory and and or registered. It's just different terminology for the same thing. Um, yeah, the Kiwis have to have their own words. Yeah, we have funny <laughs> words, but anyway, different from Australians too, just in case you're wondering. But um, yeah, you'll know when you've got that complete. Uh, the, the the area that's a bit challenging in building an asset inventory is actually pump stations and treatment plants. Um, pipe pipe inventory is actually not too too bad because they're pretty distinct elements. Um, and it's only just a matter of uh, how you're grouping your hydrants and your valves and your, and your T's and stuff like that more than anything. Um, when you get into pump stations and or larger and more complex treatment plants, it's what level you're breaking it down to. And so you could start at a very high level uh, just describing your major process trains, but then you might want to get down to individual um, key elements within there like pumps or motorized valves or or screens or whatever it is that you've got there. Um, so often you'll have two two goes at the mechanical electrical treatment assets. I think you can get a first a first run through and then get on with other stuff. But you might want to go down to more detail later on, depending on the analysis you're doing. Um, with condition assessment, it's really interesting because obviously there's some uh, assets like your civil works at a treatment plant and or most treatment plants. You can go and have a look at everything and get a fairly good handle on what's happening. Uh, with pipes and particularly water pipes, it's it's a lot harder. Um, and what you end up having to do is using other other things as a proxy for for conditions. So that starts being breakages or leakage, um, or you might have done the say on some steel pipes and specific testing or something like that. So it's just looking at what you've got and what you can get with a you, you don't with condition assessment. You can end up spending a a huge amount of money and not gaining very much extra knowledge. So it's having a, a bit of a filter on that. Um, in terms of the maintenance program, the reason I put that there as a basic is that, well, in New Zealand we started at what pushed our asset management around initially was renewals. We had big renewal backlogs for pipes mainly. And you forget that where do you spend most of your money? You actually spend an awful lot of money in asset maintenance and operations. And that's, um, that's that, like if you talk to accountants and they're looking out for fraud or anything like that, they'll always say, follow the money. And in asset management, if you're wanting to make your biggest gains, where, where you're putting your biggest amounts of expenditure in, and then have a look at that um, and say, well, is there, is there some things that we can do smarter? Um, can we optimize some of our preventative maintenance? Um, a little example, a few years ago I was doing uh, a contract for a quite a large uh, utility in New Zealand and they had wastewater pump stations, they had 120 odd of them and they were inspecting them every day. 
And we said, well, yeah, that's a lot of inspection. Why are you inspecting the pump stations every day? And so we just asked that little why question, you know, like the two-year-olds do. It's a really great question to ask when you're doing asset management. Why are we doing this? And it turned out that the whole reason that the, the daily inspections were there was because that's what they used to do 20 years ago. About 20 years ago was before they put skater or telemetry in, and they had a really good skater system. And so we said, well, do you really think you need to be doing daily inspections? And the answer was no. Um, and so in that case, they, they decided in the end that they would go to weekly inspections, um, and they were looking for uh, build-up of fats and making sure the, the, um, there was no blockages in the pumps and that it was clean and they were washing down the well and things like that. So there was still a really good reason for a weekly inspection just to make sure they stayed on top of proper problems, uh, preventative maintenance. I, I think they probably could have gone to two weekly or even monthly with the amount of skater they had telling them, but little steps. Um, and the thing that happened was that they didn't lay those guys off that were doing the, the daily inspections. They, they then redeployed them to do some other things that hadn't been happening that they needed to do. And, but they were just being far more effective in terms of that part of their, their maintenance program. So. I think that's why you do that. You'll know when you're at a level and then you can start, uh, or if you haven't already, you can be putting risk over the top of that and criticality analysis and uh, starting to do some a bit more asset analysis. But if you get the basics right, then you'll take care of a good lot of it. Okay. Um, do you have more questions, Don? Yes, we have plenty. So, <laughs> um. <laughs> What would you see as the best way that regulatory agencies can help communities develop asset management programs? Okay, um, I think I'll take that one or, and let Ross jump in as he wants. Um, since we have a little bit reg different regulatory structure over here as over there, but um, certainly the systems need to be um, incentivized. Uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about the moral hazard I think I think we could start by talking about there's a, there's a little ratio that we've come up with in New Zealand um, having been fully mandated so people haven't had a choice um, and what we've observed is that 15 to 20 percent of the municipalities said great asset management where have you been in my life I understand it you know I really like it management and governance have, have seen the seen the benefits and they just jump in and get on with it and do it very very well Somewhere between 60 and 70 percent uh, go, yep, we know we've got to do this, and they, they do a pretty honest attempt at it. Um, they're not going to lead the way, they're not leading the pack. Um, and, but they, they, they just get on and do a good solid effort and stay, stay with the programs and things like that. The problem that we have, and I think the problem that if you stop and think about it, most places will have is that bottom 15 percent. And they're the ones that only pay lip service or they only, you know, if we've got to do this, we, we don't believe in it, we're just going to do the bare minimum of compliance. And they drag the chain and they make mistakes and they have all sorts of problems and then whoever the regulator is feels the need to regulate to, to deal with that bottom 15%. The trouble is that you can never make the regulation just for them. So it, it ends up being the regulation for everybody and so the bottom 15% of your, of your industry uh, or your area end up setting the regulatory framework. It's a bit like, it's a bit like criminal law, you know, if, every, if, no, if there were no criminals we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't need a whole lot of laws. Um, so it's the bottom that always sets the, the legislative or regulatory framework and it's something to think about. Heather and I were actually talking about that the other night. And we said, hey, that's the same with people that yell and scream about tariffs as well, you know, or changes in rates. It's as, a, as an aside, you never hear from 85 or 90 percent of the people. They they just, oh yeah, well, if you need that to run your utility, you need that. It's that bottom five or one even one percent that jump up and down and make a lot of noise, um, and and then everything changes because of them. And it's a it's a really interesting thought when you think of it in that way. But so. Coming back to the, the regulatory thing, I think it's being aware of that dynamic and being aware that there is going to be a, a 15 to 20 percent of, of authorities or municipalities or water districts or whatever who are going to struggle and what do you do to assist them. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things that hopefully we can eventually address in the United States, I think one of our biggest dilemmas is the way that we fund water systems. Um, 
a lot of times the funding is going to the worst entities instead of the best entities and there's a disincentive um, sometimes to do something like asset management because the worst systems are getting the funding faster and sooner than the better run systems. So then they see, you know, why am I doing all this if somebody else who's run worse than I am is getting all the money? And that's one issue so that we have that sort of the moral hazard issue where we're trying to do the right thing by improving public health but we have the, the opposite side of trying to say, well, if you're not running your assets properly, you're actually getting more funding. But the more important component that we have is actually the idea that our funding agencies only fund capital projects. They don't fund what they consider to be operation and maintenance. So sometimes a more efficient operation for an entity would be to do more maintenance, do more, you know, maybe interventional maintenance to put off a um, capital project, but when they go to get funding, the capital project is going to be funded and you know what they had wanted to do couldn't be funded because it's more of a maintenance kind of dynamic. And eventually we have to come to grips with that of being able to fund the efficient operation as opposed to you know you fund O&M out of your customer revenues and you get funding from the federal or state government to fund capital projects and that can really be a, a, a a problem with asset management. And Heather, I was just wondering if we can go to that slide with the, the, uh, the worst first slide. Um, this is something that we've found over the last 18 years in New Zealand um, is that there's, you've got to be really, really careful about the behaviour you're incentivised. If, if you're putting a contract out, just a straight you know, maintenance or construction contract, if you write it in such a way to incentivise a certain amount of behaviour or punish a different behaviour, that, that will alter the way that that contract goes. And in terms of regulators or funders of utilities, if you, if you um, incentivise worst first behaviour, which is, which is just letting the system, so what that is is letting the system degradate to a level where you've got a heap of problems, a lot of breaks or a lot of overflows or, or and, and then you chuck a whole lot of money at it because that's a, that's a problem that's on the front page of the paper every day. Um, that is like fighting a, a wildfire. It's just, it's just firefighting. It, it feels good at a certain level, but it's just, um, it can cost three or four times as much as, a, as an optimised, um, running a system in an optimised way. So you're, you're wasting money that you could have otherwise used in other places. But the trouble is there's this moral hazard because if you, if you reward that poor behaviour, everybody else notices. And so the people that are running their systems well then have to run an argument that says, well, hey, their, their governments might say, well, why don't, why don't we just let our system run down like the next door neighbours have and, and um, yeah, we'll get all this federal money, all this regulator money, you know, because why are, we, why are we doing the job properly? And it's a really valid question. So the, the thing that you, we've, we've mostly managed to avoid Encouraging that sort of behaviour in New Zealand every now and again is it, it gets close, um, but it is important to to reward good management and good behaviour and good uh, and good asset management. And for towns and and, uh, and authorities that let their assets fall to bits, you know, make them pay for it. Uh, one way or the other, do not reward that poor behaviour because otherwise everybody gets the message. Okay, Don, uh, do you have more questions for us? Yes. In a small system with a small staff that is learning, can we deploy an asset management program ourselves with CUPS or are we going to need to hire a professional to complete the job? This is one of my favorite questions. <laughs> um, not necessarily specifically about CUPS, but rather um, whether you need to have a professional or not. And I would say my, my response is that having the plan at the level that you yourselves can implement is better than having a plan that's way above that level that somebody else did for you. I absolutely believe that you can do much of it yourself. Maybe you need a little help now and again from you know an outsider to help you with a specific thing, but you can do as much as possible yourselves and the you will gain a lot from having looked at your assets yourself and instead of having somebody else look at them you will gain a lot by going through the thinking process because you really want the understanding of asset management to reside in your organization 
and not somebody else. In fact, we had a meeting yesterday, an asset user group meeting here in New Mexico, and one of the comments that came up is that communities that use engineers a lot to do various things, you know, design and and build and that type of thing. The engineers have tons of information about the systems, but the systems don't have it. And that's a real problem because the, the communities themselves, the water systems, need that information. If there's mapping or condition information or manufacturing information, the communities need that information. So if you hire somebody to come in and do it for you, much of that knowledge will not reside with your staff but will reside with others and you won't get all the benefits from that. So you really want to make sure you take advantage of what's you know, your own staff and your own kind of building your own thinking process around asset management. And that may mean you can't have a fancy map. Maybe your map is a lot more simple. Or maybe you have a more simple asset inventory. Maybe you use an Excel spreadsheet or something else. Um, that helps you put that in and maybe if you'd hired an outsider they're going to come up with a fancier database but you're better off to have your spreadsheet that you know how to use as opposed to a database that maybe you're not comfortable with so I do believe that you can do a lot of it yourself yeah and look the, the thing that Heather was saying around the your uh, consulting engineers or outside engineers holding all the information we've been through that loop several times in New Zealand and now we've had some particularly nasty examples of large, and in our case it was large, but didn't necessarily be consulting firms who had, had outsourced all of the engineering design and management and asset management to them. The, the cost just got too high for the community. They then wanted to reacquire the information and pay, pay to gain basically. And so the, we're a small country, there's only 4 million people there and the word got out pretty quick and, and pretty much now every municipality and water authority in New Zealand holds its own information. Um, they, they don't, the, every contract that's let, the, the information has to come back. There's no, the, 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 all the firms if they want, the, the outside consulting firms, if they want to do the job, they've got to return the information. They don't get the job if they want to hang on to it. And so because it's applied across the board, there's no competitive disadvantage to anybody um, in that environment. So. Um, it's, it's sorted it out and, it, and now we're getting into a situation where we've got regional mapping services showing all the utilities and things like that and so because all the information is in a publicly available space for each utility it's working really well. The other thing and I'd just like to make perhaps a, a little comment about asset information systems, um, my little bit of my background there is that is one of my consulting strength areas and uh, such that the International Infrastructure Management Manual was reviewed in 2011. I got the job of rewriting that section of the manual for the whole of Australasia. So my peers across Australasia recognise that that's, I'm, I'm as good as anybody in that field. And for a, a small authority, an Excel spreadsheet is fine. Uh, the, the reason I'm saying is there's a lot of systems vendors out there and they'll, they'll come and, and sell you. And there's some very good systems. We, we're using a lot of them in New Zealand. And, I know of a lot that get used in Australia, but it's horses for courses. You 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 get what you need to do the job that you need to do. And um, if you're quite a small thrower, you've only got uh, half a dozen or a dozen staff. You're not going to have the staff overhead to support a big asset information system. And and the other myth, and we still run into it in New Zealand. This is 18 years down the track. Is oh, I will buy some software and it will do my asset management for me. And it's the biggest myth that's out there, because asset management is not about software. It's about business processes. It's about thinking your way through how you manage your assets. And software is only a tool to help you do that. It won't do your thinking for you. And and so I support what Heather was saying is that you the best result is to go and uh, get the information yourself find out and have a look at your own assets and see what's going on with them um, and then do your own thinking about what, what it is to, what do I need to change in terms of maintenance or what do I need to change in terms of my, my replacement program or hey if, if I'm only funding 50% of, of the work that's needed for the next 10 years let's go and tell some people about that and start the debate now at our governance or our board or our community um, because if you leave it, it's just going to cost you three times or four times as much anyway. So. Okay. Uh, next question, Don. Um, and on that same note, what is the most user-friendly software we can use? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to even give you an answer for that. Um, I think the thing is that 
in, in the International Infrastructure Manual, what I, I did was I had a five, I put, I know this is in there because I wrote it, um, and, and it's public information if you bought the manual, the 2011 version. The, the user-friendly software is actually the wrong question. Um, the question should be, what outputs do I need from my system? And once you sort out what it is you need out of any piece of software, so what questions do I need to answer, then that presupposes a whole lot. There's, there's, a whole, there's four other questions. You need to involve your governance and your management of your organization and say, well, you, do you agree with the outputs that we've come up with? Get, get that political and management agreement that, hey, we need to answer these questions or we need, if it's a regulatory requirement or a state reporting or a federal reporting requirement, whatever it is, get a list of the outputs that you need. Once you, everybody's agreed on that, then you need to look, sit down and say, well, what inputs do I need to answer those outputs? Because there's absolutely no problem, or there's no point in collecting information that you're never going to use. And that's what we did in New Zealand. Now, back in the 90s, we, we um, implemented quite big asset systems, and they had all these fields that you could fill in. So we thought, oh, well, we'd be going to fill in all these fields. And so we went and spent five years collecting lots and lots of inventory and filling in fields. And then for a lot of them, we said, you go, once you got to the point to analyze stuff, you went, oh, never going to use that. Oh, what did we collect that for? And of course, once you have start collecting stuff, you then feel the need to maintain the information as well. So what outputs do I need? What inputs do I need to get those outputs? The third part of it, and I've got agreement and sign off from my management, senior management, and also my governance, because I'm going to have to pay for this, and it's, it's software plus time. Uh, somebody's time, either yours or external consulting resources, then what are my business processes? Because if your business processes aren't in place to support turning inputs through software to outputs, then you will just won't get the, the right result. And so that's business processes around data collection, business processes around quality assurance, business processes around updating of data, and a whole heap of other things like that. Now, when you've got all that lined up, then go look for some software. And the thing is, you'll know what the answer is at that point too, because you'll have a fairly good idea of what it is you want and how much you want to use it and how you want to need need to use it. And there's a there's a lot of really good packages out there, so that's that's all I can say on that. And I think um, it, it's also a hard question to answer because what's user friendly to one is not necessarily user friendly to another. So there's not like one right answer of what's user friendly because somebody understands a database better than a spreadsheet, somebody else understands a spreadsheet better than a database, somebody else just wants to use a piece of paper because that's what they understand. Yeah. So it's really a matter of, you know, a lot of it is personal, what you know and what you feel comfortable with. And I think, you know, Ross is absolutely right that I have actually worked with quite a few folks over the years who right away jump to buying the software. Hmm. Uh, maybe they've been at a conference and they've heard about it, maybe their neighbor has that software, maybe they, you know, like the name or who knows what, but they right away will jump to buying a software and investing in that software and then they don't go back until much later to say, well, what, what did we actually want it to do? And then find out that the software doesn't actually meet the needs they really wanted to do. Or maybe it's way above what they needed and they spent a lot of extra money on a software that maybe they needed something much simpler. So I think it's really important, as Russ said, to do the thinking part first you know, what do you want the software to actually do for you? What are you going to use it for? And then go seek something, and you'll be able to tell if what you're looking at matches what it is you want it to do. And then that way you can get much closer to what you actually need instead of, you know, buying the software first. Um, because I think, you know, the myth that Ross mentioned of how people equate software to asset management is part of that. That if you think, oh, I have to do asset management right away, you want to go buy something. And that's really not it. It's really about the thinking part that goes behind it. And the software is just a tool to help you do that thinking or that analyzing. It's not the same as asset management. Yeah. And look, we've got, um, and being a small country, we've got a lot of very small authorities. And what, we, what we've observed with them was that we, we had national purchasing of software uh, that was organized and we got great discounts. And, it was aimed around the mid to large sized authorities and it worked really, really well for them. But with the small guys, they just couldn't support the software. It was too complex or it was just too much overhead for them. And so what we've learned from that um, over, you know, and it took us 15 years to, to learn that. And they just slowly drifted away from the 
the larger system simply because they tried and tried and couldn't support it or couldn't hold the staff that knew about it or, or whatever it was. And I think if you're going to buy any software, you need you, you've got to be very clear about the arrangement. If you're buying a bureau and somebody else is doing all of that, then get the costs all sorted and 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 um, do it that way if you want to. But you'll find that the costs will be quite a bit more than you initially think. Um, if you're trying to get somebody else to do all your thinking for you, well then that's a problem in itself um, because you're actually not going to ask the right questions in the first place. So you're going to get the wrong answers to the wrong questions and pay quite a lot for that. But if you've got software that you're, even if you're buying it off the web as a software as a service or whatever, but you're going to be using it as an in-house resource and, and doing that, and that's quite a good result, be it in-house software or, or web purchase, you've got to buy it at a level that you can support it and sustain it long term because there's absolutely no use having only one person in an organization that knows how to use something and then they go and where are you? Or one person has built a black box themselves and then they go and how does anybody else use it? And so it's what we found with our smaller authorities is they, they came down to some little GIS uh, map info level type base systems that they generally had map info for their regulatory planning and stuff like that. So they had in-house resources that knew how to, to use map info and it was widely used across the organisation. It worked really well for them, but that, that's just New Zealand. Um, the, the, key, the key message there was simply make sure that whatever you buy you can sustainably support as an, as an agency or an authority um, over a longer period of time because otherwise you're just going to waste your money. So. Okay, Don? I've seen many guides to asset management, many of which are very similar to others. Is there one guide, internationally or nationally, that is usually seen as the model for asset management? And if not, what are two or three of the most commonly used guides domestically and internationally, particularly for small systems? Well, um, I guess it's a shameless plug, uh, <laughs> but the um, Environmental Finance Center, uh, our center, wrote the um, AM Can Work, and that was meant to be for smaller to mid-sized utilities. Anybody can really use it, but it was geared more for smaller to medium-sized utilities, and we were trying to be um, <coughs> offering different possibilities for different size utilities and the whole thought behind the manual was that it was more focused on the thinking part and not a prescriptive you know fill in the blanks and you'll have a plan it was more guiding people through the thought processes um, we do have that manual available um, to anybody who wants it for free we were very lucky that the state of Kansas who paid for its development agreed to allow us to make it available um, that was very generous of them to do so so um, you can, we can send you a link to that manual after this webinar and you can access it online. Um, again, so that was something nationally that's used and I know there are a lot of different places using the manual. Um, New Mexico is using it as, as sort of a guide to how asset management is going to be done here. Kansas, of course, is using it. Um, many other states are, but it, it is not Kansas specific. It's very generic for anybody who is doing asset management, it kind of just helps you. And there's also a lot of videos from other um, organizations who are doing asset management. And actually, Ross is featured in a couple of the videos when he was here before we filmed him. So um, there's a lot of good information in there. So on the national side, that's one I can mention, um, you know, that is a guide for environmental or uh, asset management. And then Ross can speak on the international side. Well, I could. I mean, the, I, I obviously have had a look at the, the guide, the, Can the Kansas one that um, Head has written. I think it's a really good guide for small systems and there's some very clear and easy to use guidance sheets and stuff in the back of it that if you started with that you'd, you'd go a long way down the track. Um, out of Australasia there's the International Infrastructure Management Manual which is more of a toolkit so it has a whole heap of discussion and ideas and case studies around different tools for the different components of asset management. That's a very, very good overall guide. Um, there's, in, in both in Australia and New Zealand we've got practice guides across a range of and, and subsidiary guides, but they, they tend to be a little bit more specific to the practice that we have over there. Um, just in February the, there's the ISO 55000 series of standards that have come out for asset management. 
They're not going to tell you how to write an asset plan or do your asset management, though. Uh, um, they are, uh, if you know ISO 9000 or 14000, they're management standards, and uh, 55000 is, is along the same vein. So they're quite high level, and they set a framework as opposed to a lot of specifics, and they have a whole long, I think there's like 70 or 80 you shall type statements in there. So if you're doing asset management, you shall do this, this, and this. Um, but if, if you do like using international standards, that's just out, and, it, and it's going to be quite useful, I think. Um, particularly for larger authorities where they, with ISO, of course, you can get accredited assessment that says you meet the standard. Um, big, big process, costs a lot of money, more suitable to quite large utilities. But I think in Australasia, particularly, the larger utilities will probably go down that track. Um, just because they've already got ISO 9000 and 14000 type certification and it's part of their business process and practice for a large organisation. A um, lot more formalised, documented system, a um, lot of uh, quality assurance and stuff like that. I don't know that it's particularly appropriate for smaller systems, um, but it's just to be aware that's out there. Uh, you may have heard of PAS 55, which is a, is a UK standard. Well, that was the precursor to ISO 55000. So if you if you know about PAS 55, then that's become um, superseded in the last few months. Uh, that, that would be the main ones. And But I, I think, to be honest, start with the, the Kansas one um, via the environmental finance. It's a pretty good set of tools and guidelines to get you started. Okay, John? Can I hear some examples of system defining level of service with their communities? It seems a great collaboration in theory, but not necessarily easy to do in practice, no? Uh, I would say that's probably um, true, that it is a little bit harder to do in practice than in, than in theory, because you do have to go out and seek uh, your customer input, and that's not always easy to do, because as Russ mentioned, when we, we kind of talked about the 15% at the top, the 70% in the middle, and the 15 at the bottom, you know, who are the customers you typically hear from, your 15% at the bottom who are complaining about, you know, whatever, and then you don't want to base all your level of service standards on those people who are, who are complaining, you want to have an across the board, you know, what do my customers really want. So um, I think there are some difficulties in getting that customer input when you're first sending your level of standards, but I'd like, uh, Ross, if you can comment on how maybe New Zealand has done gathering of customer data or how they handle that piece. Yeah, and I think the thing is you've got to go back to setting service level standards to start with because every utility authority in the world already has a set of service level standards that have been worked out over a long period of time, as long as they've been in business, based on what people wanted. It's just you haven't called them levels of service and you haven't documented them. But a really simple example is if your community wants um, a fast response to breaks and so maybe you've got your response of a crew on site down to an hour or even half an hour depending on what people have been prepared to pay for and that's been the norm in your community or your your water authority that's a service level you know our service level is our response to site is, is half an hour or an hour or two hours or three hours whatever it is based on your circumstances um, that's nothing new, you know, like that's something you've worked out over a long period of time. Maybe maybe you've got some other service levels set by permits or, or things like that. So the first thing that you need to do when you're sorting out service levels is sit down and try and write down what you've got now. What am I doing right now? That's where we started because uh, back in New Zealand was, um, well, what, yeah, we know we do all this stuff, but how do we turn that into service level speak? And so we sat down and wrote those down and it was things like pressure and it was things like response to customers and, and time on site and uh, the longest period of an outage that we'd want and if we had a plan shut down, you know, we have a you'd have a service level around notifying people publicly and stuff like that or if it's an unplanned shutdown that you were supposed to try and notify down the street with a loud hailer or something like that before you did it and uh, those are all service levels. Um, even even the cost per per year or per month or whatever it is or per per unit of water that you're metering can be that's a service level. Um, so when we first did it, what we didn't realise is that there's sort of like two levels of service levels. There's the customer ones, the ones that the customers care about, and then there's a whole heap of technical ones. So 
For instance, the customer doesn't want to know that there's so many pounds per square inch pressure. They just want to know they turn on the tap and it runs and they hop under the shower and they get a reasonable flow of water. So a customer service level in that instance is, I want a reasonable flow of water at a reasonable pressure. With that, that's sort of a, a generic statement. As a, at the technical level, you're just going to say, well, we're going to supply so many pounds per square inch of pressure at, at so much volume per customer line or something like that. So it's a lot more technical measure. And, and you could go and check that by putting a pressure gauge on a, on a, a service line into a house or checking at a tap or something like that. Or you could express it, I need to fill a 10 gallon bucket in, in, in however many seconds or, or whatever, however you want to express it. Um, so what we didn't realize when we first got into it was that you do have customer service levels. You know, another, the, the, Potability of water, we, you'll have a whole heap of standards, um, EPA standards in the state and even local standards maybe around what, what is potable water. The, the customer doesn't actually care about that, they just want water that's safe to drink. And so, you know, a, a customer service level is our water is safe to drink. But technically that means a whole lot of stuff that nobody really cares about apart from water professionals and regulators. Um, so, so when you're doing your service levels, is, is big have a go at the customer ones because they're the ones you need to consult on and there might only be, like typically we would have five to seven in New Zealand now, we've had way more than that with the customer ones but we've, we've you know, you get, when you've had six goes at it, you, you get better every time so those are the ones that you consult on and then the technical ones uh, are the ones that are set off and by permit or by regulation or by industry practice and those are the ones you measure internally that, that tell you that you're meeting the custom one and you link them up and, and away you go. Great. Uh, Don? Okay, this is kind of a two-part question and I'll read through the whole thing. We have one part-time operator who is also the GM and the secretary. How often does the inventory, the condition, and the asset management plan need to be updated? In your experience, could this reasonably be the responsibility of our all-volunteer board? I think in that circumstance, once you've built the original inventory, um, the thing is that in very small systems, unless you're you're replacing some assets, in which case you'll know about it, or you're adding a new area, things don't change that much or that quickly. So um, bigger authorities, you've always got stuff going on because there's always renewals or, or um, development going on or whatever, um, bigger cities and towns. But in a very small system, if it's stable, once you built your inventory, uh, maybe you're only going to just do a check once a year and just go, hey, was there anything that changed? Um, the things that catch you are like if you swapped out a pump and put a new pump in or something like that, you might want to update it. Um, but the people would know. It's not something you're going to sit down in that case and do every month or every week. Whereas my recommendation for a larger or mid to larger size utility is that you do your additions and deletions monthly because then you nail the process and you stay on top of it. We've had terrible problems in New Zealand with people leaving it a year to three years and then everybody forgets what happened and um, yeah, it takes a long time to scramble around and find all the capital works projects and make sure you've got them all and all the renewal projects and any of the, the you know, mechanical large maintenance where you've swapped pumps out or screens out or whatever. Um, so it is, in a, in a, where you've got a, a bit more of a dedicated team, I think monthly is the ideal. Um, if you're doing something every month, you have to you have to nail the process, and once you've done that, then uh, it'll flow quite smoothly. With with a very small, very stable system, um, inventory, asset register, condition, uh, a condition could even be once every sort of three to five years. Um, the inventory or the asset register maybe just do a check once a, once a year to say, hey, what's changed and stay on top of it. Yeah, and I think the second part of the question was, you know, could the volunteer board kind of work on this? And I think once you've got the process in place, again, looking at it as a very small utility that maybe not a lot is changing, um, you know, it might not be so burdensome for your volunteers. It, it would still, in my opinion, be better for them to do it than for you to consult out each year to have somebody come in and do it for you. Um, even if you have to do it a very simple way, or maybe it takes you a little bit more time, maybe it's a year and a half instead of a year to get it all done. Um, having your own eyes on your assets and kind of having your own involvement in the process is a really good way to learn about your system. 
Um, you know, some of the folks who went and did inventories and did condition assessments learned a lot about their system that they didn't really know. Um, you know, assets that were kind of in worse shape than they realized, you know, maintenance that hadn't been done, um, tasks that have been put off because nobody really stopped and kind of took a look at the assets and kind of took that bigger step back. So you, <clears throat> I think you can do it with your volunteers. You may, you may just have to set the time horizon that fits best with the people that you have and the time availability. Um, but if you look at maybe a year to a year and a half if you're a smaller utility and try to you know, do it in little pieces over time, you know, you, I think you can do it with your staff. Yeah, I think a small system like that's most likely just to have an Excel spreadsheet um, as their inventory. So it's not going to be a big effort to change stuff. Uh, you'll know if you've replaced a pipeline or a pump and you just go to that one and go, hey, well, that one's gone and you know, it was an old steel pipe and now we're putting a plastic pipe and it's, it's six inch, it was six inch. You know? So it's, it's a really quick exercise. You're not talking weeks of time to, to update those sorts of things. It's maybe going to be a couple of hours once a year and, and you'd have it cleaned up. So. Okay, uh, Don? I just wanted to add that we know that there are lots of systems out there that would be very grateful to have their board to be involved at that level. So I think it would it could be a very good thing. The next question, um, can you list the common outputs of an asset management program? Um, I wonder if they're talking about like the database, the outputs that we mentioned um, from the database. And I think, you know, you have to think about what is it you want to make decisions about. And that will help set your outputs you know, for your process, you know, what kind of information do you need out of a process to make decisions that you need to make? And it would probably be, you know, very system specific of what you're trying to get at. So, uh, Ross, if you want to talk more about the output side of things? Well, I think to say the first thing I'd say is back 18 years ago, we had no idea what outputs we wanted. So we put a whole lot of stuff into databases and, and it was all a bit new. And, got to the end of that and said, oh, now what can we do with this? Um, and even even now, we're still, a couple of my staff work with systems um, all the time and just getting people to go, what do you actually want out of, what question are you trying to answer is, is still a huge problem. So it's a, it's, a, it, it's a good question because it's a very hard question for people that are starting to answer. Um, I think as, as Heather says, it really depends on what's, what's in your system and what sort of state it's in and even what, you've got to come back to what's driving you to do asset management and why you, what are you trying to, what questions you're trying to answer and, and you start simple. So if, you, if you're concerned that you've got a lot of pipe that's pretty old and it's starting to break a lot, um, then the question you might want to answer is, well, how much do we need to spend each year to stay on top of this and, and when do we think the big lumps in expenditure are going to be? And, and then the third question you might want to answer is, in that case is, um, well, have we, have we got the money? Have we got the governments, the board on side to pay for that? And so that will set you about collecting a certain amount of data. You're going to get an inventory of all your pipes. The, get the best, to your best knowledge of the material and the age of them and, and to the best of your knowledge of the condition of them. Um, I've worked with other authorities who have had very, very new pipe, uh, like it's only 20 or 30 years old, but a lot of little pumps because they were in quite sandy conditions and their, their wastewater lift stations were uh, you know, only going down about 1.8 metres before they had to put a pump in. And in their case, they had you know, over 100 pumps um, all 25 years old, so all sort of getting towards the end of the life, and they had one guy who was the, that whole conversation started around, um, and we'll call him Bob, he was the pump supervisor, and he had a little black book where he kept everything, and I and, and they'd spent a lot of effort putting their pipes into their inventory, and they hadn't got the pumps. I said, what, so Bob doesn't come to work tomorrow? And they just said, we'd be, we'd be gone. You know, he's the only guy that knows everything about these pumps and where they're at. And so I said, well, if it was me, I'd stop working on the, the pipes because your pipes are actually quite new and they're not in too much trouble. And I'd start getting everybody to get to know a lot more about these pumps because, you know, Bob's a good guy, but he's also 55 and he's, you know, he's not going to be here. And New Zealand retirement age is 65 at the moment. So, you know, Bob was only ever going to be there for another 10 years. And 
So it really depends on on what you've got going on, what your asset mix is, what the ages of them are, and and um, it just even what your local situation is, and then. Uh, that'll start telling you what questions you need to answer, and then that'll start telling you where you need to go from there. Okay, Don. I have come to the end of my list. Okay, well, we have um, a little bit of time, so I'll we'll go, go back, back to some questions that we had thought of before the webinar. So we'll go back to um, some other things, and maybe some other questions will come up as we um, move along here. Now I'm trying to. Oh, there we go. Uh, we'll talk a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, this is an interesting um, issue that has come up, and I think it's something that I have certainly experienced with utilities that I've been working with. And it, it was a, an issue that Ross brought to my attention about three years ago when he was here before. And I would love to say I wish Ross was wrong on this particular topic. Um, but unfortunately, he hasn't been. So, Ross, if you can walk him through the idea of the sawtooth problem, I think it would really be helpful. And, and this is a problem we've observed in New Zealand and certainly observed in Australia as well. And, and that is when an organisation starts down the track of asset management, there's usually, you know, people are keen to get going and they go and get trained and they, they, they get on with the, the work and they bring the organisation up to a certain level of capability and capacity and understanding of asset management and for many many organizations in Australia and New Zealand over a period of time maybe three or four or five years that capacity drops off and then it'll get picked up again the, the management or, or the senior engineers or whoever it is will realize hey we, we've fallen back here and they give it another push and up it comes again and this is the sawtooth problem and it simply around the fact that almost always asset management is driven by individuals and it's very very hard in the early days of it to embed that practice into the organization so the individual gives it or, or, or two or three or four individuals in, in, in a big organization um, maybe a few more but they give it a really good a shove and they get it up to a point but it doesn't embed into the organizational culture and it and it doesn't into their practices and so what happens is when the the impetus or those individuals leave or they get into different roles um, it just slides back to where it was um, because the organization as a whole hasn't bought into it and so the, the thing is that that's not a failure of asset management and some people would go oh yeah well we got to a point we dropped back we failed well no that's a that's a, just another observation on organizational dynamics and that's just the reality of organizational change management um, what we're finding in New Zealand now and this is you know, 18 years down the track is younger engineers who 18 years ago were starting in asset management and, and doing that they're now landing in very senior management positions and they don't they, they don't have any questions about it it's just part of the way they do business and so you're starting to get chief engineers and, and CEOs who who just implicitly this is why aren't we doing this you know if they go into a new authority um, get get the promotion or a job or whatever and so we're starting to see now that it's it's the sawtooth that the teeth dropbacks are, are decreasing a bit I think uh, certainly in the in the top um, 80 85 percent of authorities so the bottom 15 percent is still in that that problem where they're just not committed to it, their management, their boards aren't committed to it, regardless of the fact it's been law for 18 years. So you know, you're talking about quite a long time where where organizations can be quite resistant to change. So it's just something you probably will observe because it's just a very simple part of organizational dynamics. Be aware of it. Uh, be aware that the way to manage through it is to is to have commitment from the top to the bottom of the organization. And it's it's like anything, you need to keep training people and keep encouraging them to think a bit differently the way they used to and over time then the, the, this methodology of thinking and managing will just embed itself and become just part of the way you do business. And I think you know one other point is back to the uh, question a couple of questions ago about getting their managed their uh, board members involved in the asset management process and if more people can do that I think it can help the sawtooth problem because you see the the people who are actually making decisions can get a handle on, you know, how asset management is helping the system and what it's doing for them. And, you know, the more those kinds of people really get bought into asset management, the more the organization will change and change in behavior. 
um, to, to try to counteract the sawtooth problem and not get discouraged about what's going on. So I think if you can get your boards and your governing bodies more involved in the whole thing, you know, that will really help you embed it into the organization. Yeah, one well, well, of the things, and it's taken probably 10 years in New Zealand and, and three election cycles, but one of the things that's been very, very helpful is uh, when you get a new board or a council or, or governance body elected, um, is running a workshop or some training for them and um, taking them through how this stuff works and, and what the impacts are. And, Helping, I mean, they have been elected to make decisions on behalf of the community or, or the area being served, and generally they won't have a lot of knowledge about the, the, the intimate details of asset management. It's not something you run across if you're a managing a business or you're in a, in a you know some, some sort of public role. Um, and so we we have been running post-election workshops with with uh, elected officials across New Zealand and Australia, and I think it's been really really effective. Um, giving them the tools to write, ask the right questions of the of the, the their staff or their team, um, and get them thinking more than one year. You know, start saying, "Hey, well, if we if we defer this, there's there's going to be a lot of pain down the track." And and look, what we found, and I'll, I'll talk about New Zealand. I, I I won't make any commentary on elected officials and and. America, but we, we do elect some officials, uh, elect some governance members in New Zealand who who have platforms and, and have pre-agendas and, and won't listen and just want to do whatever they want to do. And um, people have opinions about them that might be less than favourable. So those people though, what we found is generally when you, you provide them with some good a good workshop and some good training and maybe there's two or three and that's part of a program of training of them and their role as elected official that almost all of them come on board and they can see the value of it because deep down most people are actually there to serve their communities and uh, so we've had a lot of success with that. At the end of the day you do need to engage with your elected officials, that's, that's the, that is the bottom line, that's our system of government across the Western world and um, long may we continue with that, and uh, so as professionals in the in the field, we've got to be able to present information in a way that they can make good decisions, but also not hide the risks if they make poor decisions. So if they make a decision that increases risk, or is going to increase cost, or is going to create a lot of long term problems, they need to know about that and be really aware of it and own the problem. Don't hide it from them. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the ways that that I've observed that you get asset management thinking embedded is by celebrating your successes. Uh, we're not very good at that as an industry. We don't really do a good job of explaining this is something we did using asset management thinking or asset management principles and here it saved us time or money or efforts or prevented a problem or whatever it might be and when people can see the direct result I changed the way I did things and now this is better. They get so bought in and it never goes away. Those people that understand the value don't drop back down. It's the ones who don't see the value that will drop back down and there are some people that, you know, that one victory alone has sold them for life because they know it worked and it changed the way that they were doing things. So don't forget to celebrate what worked and what was successful because that starts to get people realizing, oh yeah, we did it this way before, we do it this way now, or we made this different decision, and it either prevented a big problem, or we cut down the brakes, or we get better customer service, or you know whatever it might be, save some money, you know whatever the thing is, or even it made the operator's job easier so that he had more time to do maintenance. So whatever the thing is, celebrate those successes and make sure you document them so that in people's minds they understand the direct result of asset management and it helps them realize that it's a good thing to do and a good thing to keep doing. Yeah, and look, I mean, one of the problems that you have with asset management, we often get, you know, people say, hey, you guys in Australia and New Zealand, you've been doing this for, you know, a decade and a half, nearly two decades now. What are the savings? And, you know, we and we'll want to reduce it to a fiscal saving and, and it's a really hard question. And I'll give you an example. I, I've been over here for about a week and I've heard about a, a, an authority where they had a steel pipe over a, over a motorway bridge that let go, big pipe, wrecked the motorway, 
wrecked, the, was, a, was it an interstate or just a local just a local, local freeway? Um, wrecked half the freeway, closed the other half of it, happened over a weekend, big drama, and you know, at the end of the day it all got fixed up and they had to fix up the road, but the cost was huge, absolutely huge. And it would have been, the cost of that incident would have been probably four or five times the cost if you'd done a planned replacement. And so what you've got to be able to do is say, hey, we've been managing our assets. We, we go and inspect our steel pipes that go over bridges on, a, on a, say an annual basis, I would have thought would have been reasonable. We're on top of it. We noticed this one's had a little, starting to get some panel leaks. So what we've done is we've moved the program around and, and, we've, and we're doing a program replacement and it's costing us X. That's good management. Um, what you also need to point out to your to your um, governance and the people who are funding you is, hey, if we'd let that go, that would have cost four times that. You know, and, and replacing big steel pipes is not a, a cheap exercise at the best of times. Multiply that by four and go, oh wow, so that's what asset management's about. Yeah, it's about committing a bit of thought up front and a bit of inspection and a bit of getting the program right and and so what your your savings are, you know, when you do it right, you don't all you all you do is you're actually saving huge amounts of money. But because it hasn't gone wrong, people don't see that money saved. They say, oh well, you know, we, we're just getting on and changing, replacing stuff. It's really useful to know what if you've had one of those instances, and most people have. Um, I had one years ago where we were cleaning an asbestos cement sewer pipe just before Easter, which was a stupid thing to do at the best of times. Blew and it was it was just about wrecked and. Um, through a major intersection and the thing collapsed and it was in our biggest industrial area. They had massive industrial flows and luckily they were all closing down for Easter with New Zealand we get a lot Friday and Monday off but we had crews out there all that weekend double time fixing a pipe under emergency repair and it was like 150 metres of it died and, and it was um, I think it was 12 inch and we took it up to, we said, oh, we've been under capacity here, let's try and take it up to, um, I think we went up about four inches in capacity, up to maybe 16 or 15, might have been 15 inch. And that was fine. And I got on Sunday, Easter Sunday, you know, I got this phone call from the contractor who says, hey, Ross, you better come out to the site. And right in the middle of this intersection, there was a big 12 inch water main going across the, the sewer main with a massive big valve set. And where the sewer main was, they poured a whole heap of concrete thrust blocks for the valves and the changes in the water main. And guess what? That was 12 inch hole. And we were trying to thread a, a 60 or 15 inch pipe through it. And A didn't go through B. They said, What do you want us to do? Do you want us to knock this out? I said, No, I don't think so. I don't think we're going to be starting to play with thrust block concrete on Easter Sunday when we've got a ma the major water pipe here as well. So we put it. We had to design on site on the day of throttle and, and build it. What a mess, you know. If we'd, if we'd been able to do that job well and not in that circumstance, we'd have done it for about a third of the price, probably, and a much better result. That throttle's still there. It's just a pain, and um, there was just nothing we could do about it. And the guys that were doing the work, you know, they were good. We had to organise crews, but but by golly, it cost us some money. So you, everybody has one of those stories, and they're the ones that you need to tell your governments about. Say, look, this is what we're saving. If we do our asset management properly, we don't get those anymore, and they save you a heap of money and a heap of aggravation. They always happen at the worst possible time, too. Uh, Don, I just want to do a check-in and see if we had, had any more uh, questions come in. Oops. Yes, we do. Okay. With the water infrastructure. Before you end, um, ask that question, I just wanted to let everybody know that there's a couple of resources up on the screen. Um, a couple are Ross Waz web, uh, websites and information sites, just so you have them. And we'll try to send these links around as well. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know that those are up there. So go ahead, Don. With the water infrastructure in America crumbling, why do you think asset management has not been regulated like New Zealand? I don't know that much about American politics. Um, well, what I do know is New Zealand regulated quite early and it's been a good thing. Australia tried to do it voluntarily for a very long time and a lot of these states are regulating now. Um, what you simply realise, I think people try to do things voluntary and say, hey, this is a good idea. Um, and, it, and, you, and what you do is you get the top 20% and they were going to do it anyway. 
Um, what what I was uh, here in New Mexico, they've got a, a funding agency, and they are actually making their funding conditional on on asset management. I think that's maybe the way it's going to happen in America, where the funding agencies will actually say, "Hey, if you want the co-funding, then you're going to have to demonstrate that you've got decent asset management in place, so that we know that we are co-funding um, the right assets and the right work program." And I think the other thing is um, maybe. Authorities that are raising bonds, I think if you had good asset management, you could probably go to your bond rating agency and, and make a, a case that you're managing very, very well, and that might affect your, your bond rating. Um, you're a country that doesn't take to, to people forcing you to do things very well. There's some fairly strong historical precedent there, so I think that might be the reason. <laughs> yeah, I don't think uh, we take kindly to people telling us what to do. I also think perhaps part of the problem is the people, again, the decision makers would be, you know, Congress, for example. Um, it would take probably something in Congress or something written in either the Safe Drinking Water Act or Clean Water Act to actually make it mandatory. And I don't know for sure if all of those folks really understand the benefits that the United States could achieve from doing asset management. Um, and so it wouldn't appear to them to be a good thing to do if they don't really understand fully the benefits. So, you know, I'm kind of more of the opinion if we could even get the top 20 or 25 percent and maybe even push it down to 50 percent voluntarily, if we could start having a bunch of stories to tell that, hey, this isn't being done because an outsider says it's best, like, and by outsider I mean a regulatory agency or a state or federal agency saying you have to do this. We're doing this because it's best for us as the water and wastewater systems that are doing it, and we're doing it because we achieve the benefits ourselves. And I think if we could get enough good stories to tell, maybe down the road, they may have to mandate it to get the other, you know, 50% or 60% that won't do it without a mandate. But hopefully we can get maybe some better, you know, more examples and, you know, people really seeing the value in the voluntary world and then maybe someday there would be um, a mandate. My only caution on the mandate side is I always caution or fear, I guess is the right word, that the mandate won't be done properly. Um, New Zealand has been, uh, at least initially, was pretty open to we want sort of financial efficiency and left kind of a lot of the the, there was a lot of flexibility for an agency of how they did it, and we would not want somebody to say, you must use program yeah. X, you must fill out form Y, you must fill out form Z. I mean, I don't think we want to go down that path where it's really prescriptive of exactly what you have to do. I think we want it to be a little bit more flexible than that. Yeah, and I think the thing you've got to realize, and, and I guess this might be the case for the U.S. now, New Zealand started its mandatory asset management off the back of a savage recession, which would be our worst one since the Great Depression, which was at the, the end of the 1880s, sorry, 1980s. And so we ran out of money. We had 65% of GDP was government debt, and we just couldn't, we just didn't have money to waste. And so that pushes you to, to manage better and to do things smarter. And, and so that was what was sitting in behind it. And you had a, a basically the, the act that went through, or the, the legislation that went through to say asset management, that, that just went through. You know, there was no, it was a bipartisan exercise. There was no dispute about the fact that it was needed. And so I think, you know, you go back a decade or so ago, America wasn't in that situation. I think maybe um, off the back of this recession that you've had that, that people are thinking more about the need to, uh, to, to work as efficiently as possible and, and to get some long-term sustainability. So I think maybe you'll see some stuff as a result of just the general awareness that, that there's not a whole heap of money floating around. So. Okay, we're coming close to the end. I don't know if you have any uh, last quick questions, Don. Sorry, I <laughs> forgot to unmute. I was talking to nobody. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, that is the end of my question list. Okay. Um, I just wanted to take a couple of moments um, because we are getting to the end of our time, and I just really want to thank Ross for being willing to do this. Um, I will say that Ross volunteered his time today. Um, we have been colleagues for a number of years now, and I really enjoy speaking to Ross. And, and from Asset Management Geek to Asset Management Geek, we have some 
really lively discussions about what's going on over here, what's going on over there, and and I thoroughly enjoy having those discussions with Ross and uh, really love, you know, getting to hear what's going on elsewhere and bring some of their experiences. You know, it's nice to learn from what people do elsewhere so that you don't have to repeat the same mistakes and can kind of build on what works. And I really wanted to, uh, you know, be able to share this opportunity to talk to Ross with all of you. And I appreciate all of you signing on and sending in your questions and, uh, you know, spending this time with us. And, and I totally appreciate Ross being willing to share his experience and, you know, the wealth of knowledge that he has with all of us. Um, so hopefully maybe in the future we can reroute him here again and have a have another go at one of these webinars um, because I think it's a lot of fun to kind of you know share experiences and, and that's kind of how we learn about asset management is we learn from each other. Uh, you can't really be in a vacuum trying to do this. You really need to talk to others who are doing it and you know what worked for you and how did you think through this. Uh, we had a recent meeting in South Dakota where we talked through uh, one of the water utilities had an issue with um, air release valves and we talked through that issue as a group and we had you know several people in the room who had different perspectives and we could talk through you know hey did you think about this did you think about that and and I know the learning was much better because we had that group of people with different perspectives so you know it's really nice to have these kinds of opportunities to share different different ways of thinking and you know really work together because I think that's the way we'll get it done. It's been a real pleasure um, being part of your webinar today and of uh, I, I love asset management it really just becomes a way of life for you and, and just seeing authorities making good steps and, and serving their communities better and, and getting their uh, Everything lined up for a long-term sustainable solution just uh, pushes a lot of my buttons, and I get a lot of uh, a lot of enjoyment out of that. So it's been really nice being with you people today, and uh, hopefully that you've you've got something out of it. So I have oh, well, one last-minute question, oh. then it will take a very brief answer. So I'm going to go ahead and throw it out there. Okay. What is the minimum size of water system asset management is useful for? I'd say one person. <laughs> in my opinion, there is no size that is too small because I actually use asset management thinking for my household. I use it for my car. I use it for because it's so embedded in me, I almost can't think without it. So I don't actually think there is a level um, too small. Now, maybe Russ Yeah, no, I agree opinion, with that. I agree with that. Yeah. But I think you can do it, you know, just everyday thinking. You know, I, you know, most of us have personal budgets that are not never ending we have a finite amount of money and if you choose to buy a car you know what does that mean you can't buy or if you choose to fix your house up or move or something how does that impact other things in your life so it's no different than like a, a very very small water utility has to make those same decisions if I choose to do more replacement of this I can't do yeah, some just... of that so it's just really decision making and thought processes so there I don't think there is a level at which you know it's too low to do this. Yeah, just keep it at the right scale and you don't need a, a 500 page document if you've got a 10 household water utility. You know? Yeah, and you don't need you know, a 10 million dollar program either. You know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you've got five assets, a piece of paper might do it, or exactly. an Excel spreadsheet. Or, yeah. As long as you lower down your sophistication level, anybody, any size system can do it. And I, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that would not benefit at any level. All right. Um, thank you all so much again for being with us. We really appreciate you signing on. Um, and we'll just send you out some links that have some of these resources so that you could take a look at what Ross has. He's got some really good stuff up there on um, his different websites. So um, take advantage of that. And then we'll give you the link again to um, the resources like the um, AM Can Work guide that we have. Um, so we'll make sure you get that link so that you can um, take a look at that if you would like. And then I'll also include a link to the Asset Infrastructure, International Infrastructure Asset Management Manual. Um, it is purchased through um, Australia. I don't know if you can purchase it through New Zealand as well, but it's mainly Australia now. Uh, but it's, I'll give you the link. It's not a cheap purchase, but if anybody is interested in that, we'll just provide the link and you can go online and and make a purchase of that manual. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I'm planning to do here over the next 12 months is to put a series of teaching up on inframanage.com about that as well, just taking people through each section. So 
keep an eye on that website if you're interested in, in that and uh, there'll be some video training and, and stuff up there for that. So. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and I think this will conclude our webinar.